Good morning. I'm so glad to have everybody out this morning and the fellowshipping that's going on. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. What a beautiful day. Can you believe it's just April? It feels like it's summer out there. Maybe not in Tennessee or Florida, but uh, it's beautiful. Thanking the Lord for that refreshing rain that we had. All right. I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover this morning. Brother Joe Willis is out of town um, for this weekend to be coming in tonight. Um, but we won't see him today, so I'll finish up our lesson that we started last week. But before we do, I wanted to give you a couple announcements if you have your bulletin in front of you. Um, this next coming week here is yard sale time. And so we've had a lot of stuff already dropped off. And if you're still thinking that you want to participate in that, uh, and cleaning out, doing some spring cleaning and bringing it over and dropping it off. We have it in the, uh, the new building out there. And if you would like to help him, please let him know because they'll be uh, finishing getting set up on Thursday and then doing the sale on Friday and Saturday. Okay, also coming up is an exciting time for our ladies. This is the Mothers and Others Brunch. Um, that's going to be May 8th. 10 to 12 in the morning here at the church. And here is a beautiful sign-up list for things that you can bring. And uh, you can have um, breads and sweets and finger sandwiches, deviled eggs, fruit trays, and also list how many, your name and how many you're bringing so that we can make um, preparations for our mothers and others banquet. Then on Wednesday night on April 28th, so that's this week, uh, we have our Master Club's Backwards Night. And so parents, Help your kids come up with some way of doing everything backwards. That's always a fun time. On our faith promise for Missions Month uh, this year, uh, we've been focusing on, on missions. And for faith promise, we have at the back these cards. And these cards here, um, I took last Sunday night to explain what they are. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me and I'll talk you through it and it help you understand what faith promise missions is. But all the information is on the back. The upper section is your prayer card. You cut this in half and you keep the prayer card um, for your reminder and praying for missions. And the lower half is what you can turn in. And that helps us decide about how many missionaries we can support this coming year. We also have, um, it's not in the bulletin, but a missions partnerships. For each of our 10 missionaries, we want to have a family or two or three that connects with their missionary. And it's been wonderful where through the years we've had some folks grow very close to the missionaries that they've been praying for and communicating with and bringing information to the church. On the back counter, there's all kinds of information for our, new Jerus uh, our Jerusalem witnesses. And that's here, these gospel tracts. And someone wonderfully took hundreds and hundreds of tracts and put our church information on them. This last week, we've got a lot left there. If you can grab some of those tracks and just hand those out as you go around. Other folks have um, worked at uh, preparing these and cutting them to fit, and it's been really good effort by some folks. We thank the Lord for them. And then also one final announcement is we had a wonderful science fair for our homeschooling families this week, and it was so good that we decided to leave it up as an expose for all of the whole church to go look at all of their display boards. So after the morning service, uh, just remember to slip down to the fellowship hall. And uh, I think there's probably, Miss Becky, like 20 some of those display boards. But, and usually science fair projects are like high school only. Tell you what, some of these kids were six years old and they were doing presentations from little three by five cards and explaining what they had studied and researched. And it was really great really fun time. They did a fantastic job at the science fair, so we want to leave that on display for the whole church. Okay, lots of announcements there, but do you have any praises that you'd like to share this morning as we get started? How's the Lord been blessing you this week? You haven't had your coffee, as Pastor Matt would say, right? Yeah, he is a... Um, has a lot of coffee, but no one has quite as much coffee as Will. I mean, Will, how many things of coffee do you buy a week? Oh, like we go through um, like one of those big, like the bulk um, the, powder tubs. Yeah. Like at least one of those a week. Like so, sometimes one and a half. Like mm -hmm. a, lot. a lot of coffee brewing all the time. 
So if you haven't had that, I can't help you there. You're going to have to just perk up and pay attention as we get going this morning. Did anybody celebrate Earth Day this week? Hands high. Kevin Seiler, what did you do for Earth Day this week? Cut down two trees. Cut down two trees. There you go. Clearing the way for new growth to come up, right? So. We had uh, one family that um, is PCSing, and they uh, wanted to get their tree planted, so I met with them, and we spent two hours just having a great time. So uh, kudos to uh, John and Mary Phillips and Reese. They were out there, and Reese did just as much work as everybody else. She was in the hole as he's trying to fill dirt in, and she's down in it, and we'd pull her away, and she'd climb right back in, and uh, they planted a tree on Earth Day. So, only because that was the only time they had. It wasn't that they were celebrating Earth Day. So, yes? Amen. Great. Okay. And Ian is now 10 days old, right? Two weeks. Two weeks. Can you believe that? Came right to church. Five days old. I think the youngest person we've ever had attend church was like five or six days old and brought him to church. Yes, Becky? Amen. We'll continue to pray. A big outbreak of a very uh, difficult strain of the virus up there in Pennsylvania. And uh, 40 some people all at one time in the same area. Church and all. Yes, Sharon? Okay, I just want to spell for that. And I think it's Brooklyn. 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 Brooklyn.
Let's see if this is working here. Like I said, I'm just new and fresh with this technology, so bear with me if I make a mistake. But I don't want to reteach the whole lesson, but the, the first part of our lesson last week was heavy on looking at a lot of scriptures, and we won't look at as many this week, but we're continuing from last week's foundation. And I wanted to cover a couple things when we look at Earth Day. The first thing is this, who created the earth? God did, okay? And so He is the one who should get all the glory, right? The earth is part of God's creation. It's special. He created all life. He also created the earth to sustain life, right? Okay? But the earth is now under a curse. Every time you get a thorn in your, in your finger, you hate it. I have one in my finger right now, right at the tip of my index finger. And every single thing, I and I can't get it out. I can't see it. I don't know where it is. I'm trying to so soak it, and it's not festering up. So it's just, it's just in there on a nerve. And it's part of the curse, right? It's just part of the curse. And I uh, look forward to the day in heaven where we won't have any more thorns and, and all of that. So the, the earth is under a curse now, but God still gave us a commission to tend the earth. And that is our responsibility. We have been given dominion over it. However, we haven't quite achieved it yet, have we? So we need to be working toward that. I think it's amazing these people can tame lions and all these different ferocious creatures and all that, but still, we as, as, a, as a human race, we have not conquered and had dominion yet. What time will we have dominion? The millennium, right? Jesus Christ is on the throne, and uh, during the millennium, the, uh, the, the infant child will be crawling over the hole of the asp, and uh, won't, we won't worry about it. We'll reach down the hole, pull the snake out. That's not a problem. And the lion will lay down with the lamb. That element of the curse is lifted during that 1,000-year reign of Christ. But right now, we don't see that. But we have been given the command to have conservation. And that's what I was joking last week about, the highly controversial statements that I'm going to say. And that is, is sometimes Christians, are, they just, ah, just fooey with all of this environmentalism. Well, God gave us some principles that we're not supposed to trash his creation. We're supposed to take care of it. Conservation is taught to us in Scripture. Now, how we do that may be fundamentally different than what the world is telling us to do, but the principle remains God wants us to have conservation. We have these rules to live by. So the tree hugger is going to say, don't cut down the tree, and I'm a lumberjack, uh, fourth generation, and guess what? I know how to do it responsibly. Okay, and how it can be helpful to prevent forest fires. It can also be helpful to actually further and nurture more diversity in a forest and strengthen the forest. I mean, there's ways to do this, and God has given it. Just like you tend a garden, you can tend a forest. So there's principles there. But God also gave us a caution in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16 and also chapter 2 and verse 8, he warned us to beware of the philosophy and vain deceit of the world. Don't just follow what the world always has to say, but turn to the Scriptures as our foundation. Okay? Then I switched gears a little bit and talked about Earth Day's roots. That was tongue-in-cheek. Did you get it? The roots of Earth Day. Okay? And for that... I talked about um, the philosophy that people had in the late 60s and the early 70s and um, the 80s about how we're going to see millions of people starve to death. So uh, let me switch over here. And uh, brother, can I, can I control this now? Okay. And it doesn't seem to be working. It tells me I am not in control. I do not have dominion. <laughs> User not authenticated. And so, I will refer to the 60s method. Beep. Okay. <laughs> Remember that? From school when you were a kid? And I want to be the one that turns the slide in school. Okay, we'll move very quickly. We won't take the time to read all these, but 1970, okay, the world is going to end. Beep. 1970 and 71. The world is going to end. In the next 50 years, the average temperature could drop. And we were, we were taught this fear that we're going to go into an ice age and we're all going to die. 
Okay? Beep. 89, senior U.S. official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if something's not done. 2006, we're moving closer to several tipping points that could within as little as 10 years, okay, by 2016, it'll be impossible for us to avoid irretrievable uh, damage to the planet's habitability for human civilization. And that's our Tennessee resident, Al Gore, okay? Beep. Okay, 2009, we have only 50 days left. 2009, we're gonna lose the ice caps. By the way, you see all these, these white polar bears going around and they take the video of them and they show them all starved. And uh, <laughs> did you know there's an increase in polar bears? They're not pointing that out. And they're nice and plump and healthy. Do you know why? Because there's less ice. And now they can get to the seals. But they're not showing you that. They're portraying an agenda which trying to teach you about fear. Okay, beep, next one. This is what we talked about. This is a history based on the research, the science, right, of warming periods and cooling periods since the year 2400. Okay, next slide. And this was all tongue in cheek. This is funny. This did not happen. Okay, but Babylon B, if you're familiar with that satirical um, uh, website, they, they took and they said the Amazonian uh, foresters have carved Greta Thunberg's face into a mountainside. And of course, she came out and uh, spoke on Earth Day. She is the darling of environmentalists right now. And she just turned 18 and she said she's going to party and live it up. And there's no more rules in her life because she's an adult now. And uh, she's the one who is miserable 24 hours a day and screams, how dare you damage the earth? and uh, joins in with the tree huggers, okay? Next slide. I, this is new, I didn't share this one last week, but we hear all this talk about how we're gonna change the American economy and increase taxes so that we can have the greenhouse gases reduced where we can stop global warming and climate change and uh, how that if we will raise $50 trillion in taxes, we can have this green climate plan enacted which will reduce the U.S. carbon emissions by 50%, okay? So on the red is Asia, the green is North America, and yellow is Europe, and then there's Africa, South America, and Oceania. Now, those are the percentages of people that are emitting greenhouse gases, CO2, okay? So the United States is responsible for 15%. Who's responsible for that big red giant square, China, okay? So we're gonna destroy our economy, totally wipe out our country as it is, so that we can reduce from 15 down to seven and a half. What impact is that gonna have on global emissions? Hardly anything. Okay, political rant over. Next slide. Okay, now, this is where I want to get back to Scripture, amen? Because I am not called of the Lord to be a political person. You know that. I don't talk about politics hardly much at all. I just thought it would be fun to talk about that on Earth Day so that when you are in discussions with someone, see, I have a purpose in this. When you're having discussions with someone about the environment, the reason we're talking with someone is to always get them to where we can share Christ, right? Right? So how do we get to share Christ? We talk to them on their level of what they're interested in and just put some questions out. Did you realize that we could, if we do everything that's possibly, possible we could do, we're only gonna reduce our greenhouse gases by, okay, 50%, that's gonna drop the world gases down to seven and a half, uh, seven and a half percent down. And what if the waters rise? What if the ice melts and the waters rise? Did you know God has something to say specifically about that? Really? So let's start with science. Okay, according to thousands of years ago, and of course, I firmly believe the earth is 6,000 years old. But according to scientific research, their estimates are that uh, back 24,000 years ago from today, that the sea level was at, on the left. The dashed line and then it continues the sea level continues to rise until did you notice about eight to six thousand years ago 
Are you, are you, I want to make sure you're following with me on this. The, so this is today. This is about 6,000 years ago when I believe the earth was created. So in this area, where was the sea level? It virtually hasn't risen in all of the earth's history. Isn't that interesting? Now, does God talk about that? Yeah, he does. So let me turn to these passages. I want to read to you. Turn to Proverbs 8, 29. By the way, quiz question, why is Earth Day celebrated on April 22nd? Anyone remember? <coughs> Let's call them, um, instead of Payless, like Payless shoes, we'll call them Polly's, okay? The Roman God, who was celebrated April 21st, but on April 22nd, Not Karl Marx, but Lenin's birthday. And he was an environmentalist, which would destroy his people for his agenda. Isn't that interesting? We are honoring Comrade Lenin on his birthday with April 22nd. Okay, now, Proverbs 8.29. Volunteer, who wants to read that? Corey. Proverbs 8.29. Gave to the sea this, uh, his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Okay, now everyone look at these very closely. This is a key passage. All of these four or five verses we're going to look at are going to teach us something. Proverbs 8 29 says, When he, God, gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. What does that say about the sea levels? God is in charge. God is in charge. Okay, turn to Job 26, verse 10. Back up a few books. Job 26, 10. How long will God be in charge of sea levels? Volunteer? Want to read that? Donna? Uh, he has the past the waters to found until the day and night come to me. Okay. He has set the boundary. Okay. He, he made the fence, the corral. Water will not pass his boundary until when? Until day and night end. So are we worried about, oh no, it's, it's all going to come up and we're all drowned. No, God is in control of that boundary. Let's look at another one. Job 28, verse 6. And I may have a typo there. We'll skip to the next one. Shame on me. Okay. 38, verse 8, Job 38. Follow along as we read verses 8 through 11, Job 38. Who hath shut up the sea with doors, when it brake forth as if it had issued of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall my proud waters be stayed. Have you ever built a little tiny castle uh, out of sand at the beach? And then one wave comes in and just, okay, I worked all afternoon on that. I got a sunburn for this. And uh, you're, you're playing out there. And you know what torrential waters can do. You've seen so many videos of the mountains, mountain, uh, uh, mudslides and everything, the power of the water can just destroy. You, and when you look at the most powerful thing on earth, what is the most powerful thing on earth? It's water, right? Um, in Maine, a um, lot of lumber mills, and they're cutting with metal blades, 
and they, they have for the last 30 years been experimenting with hydraulic wood cutting. Okay, putting water under a pressure like a, with a pressure washer, and it's just this bead of water that's squirted out, and the log passes through it. And Okay. It's got tremendous force, cutting power. People get, you know, under high pressure, they get their fingers cut off if they touch one of these high pressure things. Just, shoot, it's gone. So water has tremendous power. And God says, not more than me. I'll tell you where you stop, and you will not have any more destruction than I say. I lived in Pensacola, and uh, if you look at a storm surge map, there's massive sections of the community where it's like orange, red, green. Like, you're not safe. You will be flooded out when there's a hurricane. It's just the storm surge is going to raise the sea level three feet in your area. Okay, there goes your whole neighborhood. It's, it's going to flood, just the way it is. God says, I will permit it when I want it to happen. Right? Brother Corville, the, the hurricanes down there in Louisiana where he's very familiar with, okay, God will allow and control all of the environment for his purposes, but he has set a bound. Okay? Let's look at Jeremiah 5, 22. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for a bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. Who is in charge of the sea level? God is. And the scripture is our foundation of knowledge and our philosophy of life, and it comforts us, and he gives us this assurance, and we can stand up to signs and say, thus saith the Lord, I'm not concerned about sea level rising. But, but what if, okay, next slide. What if the sea levels rise and all of the east and coast and the west coast are submerged? <laughs> We wish. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was for Camarlo, right? <laughs> He's like, I left New York City. I'm done with it. <laughs> All the liberals over there and the, the, the left coasters. Anyway, someone did point out, yeah, but look at Florida. There's good people there. Um, <clears throat> well, sorry. maybe we'll give them advance notice. <laughs> if the sea level rises at one-tenth of one centimeter per year, don't you think people have enough sense and enough time to actually realize they can now get more for their land because it'll be beachfront front property for a few generations? And they can sell and they can move inland. I mean, we're talking about sea level rising according to their estimations where it's just going to take hundreds of years to shape if all of the ice melted. I mean, stop and think. Don't fall for the fear tactic. Put it in perspective, okay? Yes, the earth may look a little bit different, but what about, you know, Venice, the city of Venice? Um, it is sinking. It's not the sea level rising. The city is sinking, okay? So the earth does change, especially if you put a lot of weight on sandy ground, it's, uh, it's going to go down. I mean, so... Be careful and wise as Christians, okay? Now, interesting thought. Look at number, uh, next slide. Archaeologists have dug up an, an, a lot of artifacts as well as other evidence that there was actually sea life all through Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Why would they build these pyramids out in the middle of the desert? And how did they transport these stones that had to come by ship? Okay, I think they probably chose the most beautiful resort area to build them. And if you do the, this, you go look at the archaeology, you'll find that there was a lot of life in the Saharas. And it was a tropical paradise. But God is in charge of the environment, and all he has to do is cause an El Nina or a La Nina um, 
and in, out in the Pacific, and it can impact weather patterns. And all of this emphasis, this is about humans are doing this. Hu no, I want to give glory to God. God is doing this for a purpose. Israel was once the most verdant, green, beautiful land where they grew grapes that were this big. The Bible says so. It was the promised land, the sweet spot of the earth. It was the desire of all, all land in, in the world. It doesn't look that way today. Why? Because they rejected Christ. And God is judging. But what will happen when Christ is on the throne? The desert shall blossom as a rose. God can change with changing the temperatures of the seas in the Pacific one degree or even half a degree. He can change everything, can't He? God is in control. And I, would, I like the next picture. This is the way I view the earth. God gave me the responsibility not to trash it, not to ruin it. But when it comes down to the, the environment, I know that God is in control of the earth. The sea level, everything about it. Now, what's happening with our country? Let's compare just the way we celebrate events. Not you, but as our, our nation as a whole. The National Day of Prayer, May 6th of this year. Have you heard much about it? Okay. In fact, this National Day of Prayer in 2008 was challenged in Wisconsin by the Freedom From Religion group. Well, the National Day of Prayer under President Ronald Reagan, he made it a permanent event. In 1988, Congress enacted legislation requiring the President to issue an annual proclamation. In 2001, President George W. Bush annually hosted a high-profile event to mark the day in the East Room of the White House. However, in 2009, President Barack Obama, he issued a proclamation, but he hosted no prayer service at the White House. U.S. District Judge Barbara B. Crabb declared that the day of prayer was unconstitutional on April 15th of 2010. But Earth Day, in comparison, is the most widely celebrated secular holiday in the world. It is promoted everywhere, especially to children. Interesting. If you want someone to believe something, you've got to start teaching them when they're little. Is that a Baptist thing? Is that what Christians know? Yes, we know that, but we're not the only ones that know that. Vlad, uh, Lenin said this, quote, Give me a child for eight years, and it will be a Bolshevik forever. Unquote. He knew you've got to start indoctrinating the children with what you want them to believe when they are little. Okay? Interesting. So, back to Palais, right? Well, nobody goes around dedicating their sheep anymore and putting out little millet cakes and uh, milk for the god Palais anymore. But what do we do today? Michael Jordan. Let's call him Mike instead, so you're thinking somebody else, right? Who wrote Encyclopedia of the Gods. On the day of Earth Day, he writes this in the Pagan Book of Days. How are you to observe Earth Day? You build an altar that faces east, add some greenery, real greenery if you can't obtain it, from, or even get fake from a dollar store, it doesn't matter. Uh, if there's spring growth, just get it. And if you have a cauldron or a thurbel for a small contained fire, then so be it. But if not, then use a candle instead. For your offering, have a small bowl of milk and replace the millet cakes with cookies. Now, I'm kind of getting distracted already when he's talking about setting out milk and cookies. Uh, but back, back i got to focus here. As far as Earth Day, in the aspect of Earth Day, he continues, you may also add, wish to add your offering, giving something to the furry or feathered creatures, such as bird seed or corn or even donating pet food at a local shelter. And then perform the following spell. Take a few moments to tidy up your lawn and your personal environment. And I won't read the spell to you. I won't even give any of it any credence at all. He then says, sit before your altar, close your eyes, firmly see in your mind what refuse you have in your life's environment that you need to dispose of. Then take mental note of what spring cleaning that you need to do to make positive change. 
Then, because nature abhors a vacuum, make a mental checklist of new actions and habits you will employ from this, uh, uh, from this day, he misspelled that, on this protected, prosperous life. If you feel inclined, take the time to meditate and ask your totems for wisdom. And when you finish, open your eyes, place the offering of cookies and milk on the altar, and say, da 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 da, and place them outside for fairies and animals overnight. Okay, we look at that and we say, what a bunch of hogwash, you know? And what I'm trying to say is, every single culture in every single generation since the fall of Satan, Lucifer, he has taken something good and done everything he can to change it to take away all glory from God and focus it on something else. Now, we don't worship these fairies and goblins and all of that, and we don't do these incantations anymore now, do we? Right over here in this neighborhood, I was knocking doors and I was talking with someone, and you know what he said? He saw me coming with literature, and uh, he, he, he was just like, nope. Nope, I'm pagan. Now, continue. I said, okay, I don't want to disturb you, but I just want to ask you some questions. Okay, what I just read is paganism. It is prevalent. I believe there's a chaplain in the military for paganism. Wiccan, Wiccan pagan here, Campbell. Okay, uh, so it is growing around us. Now, when you turn on the news and you see Earth Day and all of this and, and celebrating the Earth and all that, hey, um, they're not teaching all of that. But some people are drawn away from the Lord with that. Other people are drawn away from the Lord to focus on your personal responsibility, saving the Earth and how the Earth is good and da-da-da-da-da. And all of our ancestors were bad, okay, bottom philosophical aspect, right? All of previous generations were horrible and bad, and we're the good generation, you're awesome. You donated pet food. You, you rescued an animal. I mean, all, you're good, good, good. And all of this is doing what? It's taking away from the awe we ought to carry in our bodies and our minds when we walk out and we see a plant growing and we see the trees and we study and we see how the, the cycle of water and rain and, and the distillation process and all of this takes place and the earth heals itself. You look at during COVID, during the shutdown, the polluted waters of these tourist cities in Italy actually had crystal clear water. If you ever wanted to visit Venice, that was the time last year because you could see all the way down and it wasn't filthy dirty. It was clean and dolphins were swimming there. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen that as you're going along? Oh, soul of you. And you're like, wow. You know, when it comes to this idea about sea levels rising, I just have one thought. The Bible says, my sins are buried in the deepest sea. Hey, if sea levels rise, they're just further away than they ever were. Amen? That's what I like to focus on. How would you like to have your sins that far away? Let me close out with this thought, some interesting articles. Did you realize that the, the Earth's magnetic pole is not at the North Pole? Everybody know that? Okay. But from where I am here... It's pretty close when my, I hold my compass here and it's pointing pretty close so I can follow it. But it's migrating toward Russia. Communist. <laughs> but according to what uh, geologists say, as it shifts and moves around, it actually can go stronger or weaker. I wish I had the time to show you some videos that I, I found this week about northern lights. Ever seen the northern lights, Aurora's Boreala? I grew up with those. And the air is very, very thin. There's no lights. And you're out there in a cold, cold night. You can just see everything. And then you look to the north and you can just see the green lights dancing. What causes that? That's radiation from the sun penetrating our atmosphere. And it just shows up at night. It's amazingly beautiful. It's just the, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. But as our magnetic pole weakens in its power, the more radiation gets in. So it may be beautiful, but try to fly in a plane run by a computer through that radiation. It's all messed up, right? What if that radiation gets through and wipes out our computer systems and there's nothing we can do about it? 
it is highly possible we have these EMTs, electro, uh, EMPs, electromagnetic pulses that can happen from solar flares. And so our world that we're so comfortable in, as we're like, I live by my computer, you better get used to living without it because that could happen, right? Okay, and our magnetic pole is weakening all the time as it's drifting. When it reverses, we are in a bad place. Uh, I just quoted for you, uh, I didn't quote, I just paraphrased the entire first article. Now, in a paper published by the journal Science, experts say that a currently rapid movement of the north magnetic pole across the northern hemisphere, which could signal a reversal in the cards. This speed, along with the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field by around 9% in the last 170 years, could indicate an upcoming reversal where north goes and all of a sudden the polarity of the Earth is opposite. If a similar event happened today, the consequences would be huge for modern society. Incoming cosmic radiation would destroy our electric power grid and satellite networks. A magnetic pole reversal of extreme change in uh, sun activity would be unprecedented climate change accelerants. We, uh, we urgently need to get carbon emissions down before any random event like this happens. I, thought, I love how they can jump from one thought to the other to yeah. defend, you know, just like, it's, it's, all, it's you! Because you, you eat steak and the cows, <laughs> we got to get rid of the cows because this, uh, the flatulence is causing all of this problem for us. Well, did you realize that God at any time could just cause a volcano? Right. right? Now, we do pray for those pity and pity for the people that actually are in the region that could be harmed by the volcano. Sometimes they're very devastating. The ash can carry like one. I don't know if it was Pinatubo or whatever. But it crossed the Pacific, the North America, and it went all the way to Russia and caused one of the most horrible famines that they'd ever experienced. Um, so there's problems with volcanoes. However, the last time Angung erupted in 1963, a massive amount of sulfur was emitted into the air, decreasing the global temperature by 0.1 to 0.4 degrees Celsius. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines decreased global temperatures by half a degree Celsius for two years. That half a degree can affect absolutely everything. In 1815, the world faced a global temperature drop of three degrees after an Indonesian eruption. In 1883, the explosion of Krakatoa may have contributed to volcanic winter-like conditions. The four years following the explosion were unusually cold, and the winter of 87 and 88 included powerful blizzards with record snowfall. In 1815, Mount Tambora, a stratovolcano in uh, Indonesia, uh, the eruption had a volcanic explosivity index of seven. The eruption was the largest in recorded human history and one of the largest in the Holocene, that's the last 10,000 years. The eruption led to global cooling and worldwide harvest failures caused what came to be known as the year without a summer in 1816, okay? What can we do to stop a volcano? We can't do anything, right? But God can. And so when God says the earth's getting too warm, what can he do? Let's cool it down. He knows what to do. Sea levels, we don't have to worry about them. They will not pass what God says. And the, the, the global heating, the global cooling, all of that, Folks, I share all this so that you can take this information with you and you can talk to people in your workplace, on Facebook and everywhere else when you get into your little spats. <laughs> you can just go back and forth, right? When you do that, just say, God gets the glory. Because in Romans chapter 1, what does the Bible say in Romans chapter 1 about mankind? When they look at creation, what will they do? Let's close out with that. Romans 1, and I'm already uh, over time here. Romans chapter 1. Verse 19. That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even God's eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So God reveals Himself in creation, 
Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. They professed themselves to be wise, but they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies before themselves. Now, we won't continue much more, but I want you to notice verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. And what does the next sentence say? They worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Some people say, Pastor, you love gardening. I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I know such a tiny amount about plants. Tiny. I wish I knew so much more. I am just in awe of God's creation. And I, I, I make mistakes, and I'm trying to learn. And I learned that I put mulch down on my impatience bed two days ago. And then I read, you shouldn't do that because it causes a fungus, so I'm going to pull it all up today. I'm going to have to deal with weeds, but the mulch will cause a fungus on the stems. And, and I just love my flower bed, so I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm learning. But it's just amazing. Everywhere you look, wow, God, you did all this in one second. You just poof, let there be life. Poof. God's, in, we are in awe of God's creation. So when you teach science to your little ones, make sure that the whole purpose is that they have a love and respect for the Creator, right? And if you continue reading, this is on the side, if you continue reading chapter 1, you will see where the Bible says, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. You know what that means? They totally lost every common sense, and they had a trashed out, worthless mind. Their whole thought process was wrong. Why do we have the people going around today doing these absolutely ridiculous, insane things like never, no other generation in our country has had because they have no brain left. And they think they're smart. That's Romans chapter 1. And God, He says, you did not like to retain me in your thoughts. I will give you up to a reprobate mind. We have insanity, and you can't argue with insanity. Right? You have to know the truth. Okay, we'll stop there and uh, welcome more folks. Come on in.